Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 644. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is February 3rd, 2021. Three, two, one. All right, welcome to another episode of Anglican Unscripted. I'm looking over here at the show notes, and we're going to have a very full episode. This may go hours, maybe days. I don't know. I was looking at the statistics given to me by YouTube. It says that only 80% of the audience makes it all the way to the end, George. I, I find that very... <clears throat> understandable <laughs> some of these episodes go very long i remember in the beginning we had 45 minute ones and then we we turned ourselves down to the the 17 minute standard about five years ago and since then all chaos has ensued when we sit down and record uh, because news is not something you can put into a little time capsule uh it, it happens we analyze it we talk about it and that's what you come here to listen to you just do before we get too far Please like the episode. Um, it helps with free. Uh, there's coughing going on in the background. We have a live studio audience today. It's okay. Uh, share this episode with your friends and foes. And please do what everybody does. Go to the comment section and leave your comments on the topics we're talking about. This episode never dies. It will always continue in the comment section. George, how are you doing this week? Well, Kevin, before we start that, I, I'd like you to explain to people why they should like the show, not only because they like it. What does it do to the YouTube algorithms uh, well, by liking? Yeah, both Facebook and YouTube uh, promote products that are liked on their platforms. And so if you like it, it tells Facebook somebody with your profile, and they know exactly who you are, like this episode of this program. And when they find somebody else who's pretty close to you and has your beliefs and your uh, political beliefs and Christian beliefs, they will say, hey, you may like this as well. And it's just it's an algorithm that promotes the show. And for us, it's free advertising. That's how when we started this program back 10 years ago now, we only had an audience of 300. We have multiplied that many, many times over because of help from Facebook and YouTube and you guys liking it. If you guys don't like the program, YouTube figures that out as well. So you don't have to dislike. So, Basically, hold on. Let me be honest. In this advertising realm of Facebook and YouTube, not liking, clicking like is as good as clicking uh, unlike. So that's, that's yeah, a hard and, reality. We we don't we don't do advertising. We yeah. don't do this constant round of solicitation for money. Um, the only way we're able to sort of keep out there is by expanding our audience, and we can either tr ask you for money so that we can advertise and reach more people, or you can click like and Facebook and YouTube can do it for us. Because every time we've mentioned, it's a few times in the past we've mentioned this, we've had some snarky people who say, oh, well, it's just a vanity project. Well, friends, i got to tell you, having 310 versus 301 likes really doesn't make me get up and smile in the morning. It's nice. But having the likes pushes us out there into the public eye. And that's, yeah, that's the important part here, is we're, we're not an entity that raises money to promote ourselves. Uh, we'll raise money if we have to go to an event, but we're not clicking the uh, sponsorship button on Facebook every time we put out an episode. I would go broke really quick. Um, let's move on to the news, but I wanted to say, you, you told me you went to the Slice and Dicer again this week. Um, uh, what's, your, what's your update? I uh, had something taken out of my uh, leg yesterday, and I go back on Friday to have something taken off of my back. Uh, which I blame for the summer of 1975, where I don't think I wore a shirt. Do you remember the days, Kevin, when your parents would tell you at dawn, come back for dinner? And mm -hmm. when I was a little boy, I would go outside with the dog and my brothers and the neighbors. We would do this thing called playing. Oh, we'd play it. army. We'd make a fort. We'd play baseball. We'd do Check stuff the in the outdoors. Yeah. Yeah. And usually dressed in a white t-shirt and a pair of uh, jeans with a baseball hat, 
the old-fashioned, real American baseball hats, not these god-awful new things. Uh, well, 30, 40 years later, plus living in Florida, has given me skin cancer oh, all over the place. Jeez. Yeah, uh, we had a general rule. We lived in northern Wisconsin on a lake, and Mom's rule was to my brother and I, don't come back unless you need more than five stitches uh, or you have a broken, broken bone. Uh, other than that, come back for dinner. It'll be good. It'll probably be the fish you caught today. So, you know, please go fishing again. And yeah, that's that was living in the uh, 70s and 80s. Uh, it's so much different now. I just remember being overprotective of my kids. There's just certain neighborhood kids they're allowed to play with. Um, they weren't allowed to leave the neighborhood on their bicycles. Um, we are guilty of being overprotective of our children, George. Unlike my mom, who was not well, protective. My well, I can remember my mother giving me a dime in case I needed to make a phone call where I knew where the pay phones were and I could call her if something happened. Uh, today, uh, children, I see children in Sunday school. Uh, well, when we had Sunday school pre-COVID, we have eight and six and seven, eight-year-olds with cell phones. Uh, uh, and they're difficult to wean them off it to pay attention to the Sunday school lessons. Mm -hmm. New times, COVID times. Uh, there's lots of news items here. I'm counting one, two, three, four. There could be up to seven if we get to everything. Um, the biggest news that I'm reading uh, that we're going to talk about today is the Church of England is going bust. And there's a letter to the bishop saying our revenues are down 20% and we need to start slicing and dicing our clergy to, to save money because we're not going to be able to pay anymore. And you and I reported early on, uh, May, April and May of last year, that the Church of England is going to close and be AWOL all through COVID. And we saw that. And this is the ramifications. Well, the, the facts are, um, on January 18th, a letter was sent by Church House to the members of the House of Bishops of the Church of England saying income for 2020 as of November was down a little over 8%, and they're forecasting income being down over 10% for 2021. So 20% drop over two years. The Church Times published the letter in full on uh, Tuesday of this week, yesterday. And what they're saying is that uh, we could lose up to, we could lose 20% of paid clergy positions. We're going to see a lot of churches have to be amalgamated or closed. When you have 20% of your income disappear, you have to take drastic actions. And I, I commend the Church of England for being uh, on the ball. This is a reality. Uh, my parish has seen similar cuts in income. Uh, it's not, has not may have something to do with the character of English church life, but I think everybody across the board is hurting. Uh, I have parishioners. One guy owns an Ace Hardware store. He has been funding it out of his savings the last few months. Another guy is a charter boat captain. His boat is going through the repossession process. Um, be, well, why? Because people are not leaving their homes, uh, except to go to Walmart, which you've discovered. <laughs> yes. And so... But restaurants, personal services, uh, the tour, everything, the tourist, all related things down here, hotels, airlines, and we also all taking see, a big hit. And we've churches. Seen, we've seen this in the churches, especially the real churches. Now, the press, the, the worldwide journalist press, has been AWOL as well for the last four years. They've only focused on one individual, Trump. And so you've not heard the news about all these churches closing, about these businesses that have been closing. All you've heard about is the medical response to COVID, the political response to COVID, and that dastardly, deadly person named Donald Trump. That's the only three items the news has covered. And I got to tell you that across this nation, churches by the thousands have been closing over the last six months because they're not making budget and there's no income. I'm reminded of uh, that line from Anna Karenina, that all happy families are alike, all unhappy families are unhappy in their own way. Yeah. The re not every church is 
closing for the same reasons. It's all a combination of reasons. I was joking with Kevin, my parish is sort of like a dot-com parish. We've doubled in six years. Our income has shot through the roof. We, you know, every metric has been fantastic, but we have no underlying demographic growth. Now with this shutdown, it'll be a year soon. What does that mean? My traffic has shrunk to nothing. I don't mm -hmm. get any walk-in business. And the walk-in trade, if you will, provided a quarter of my income. Wow. People who weren't fledging. And people who are uh, new to the Episcopal Church. Uh, there are Episcopal churches that are shutting down because their small key group of people are dying and they're not being able to be replaced. And they're asking the smaller and smaller group of people to give more and more. And some of them are doing out of sacrifice, but essentially, eventually that's going to break. My church, I have less than half the people as Episcopalians. They're Christians who are worshiping in the Episcopal or Anglican way. And they're not trained from birth how to give, how to, when to get up, when to get down, when to cross themselves, sure. all that stuff. So each church is unique, but it's still this wave of uh, devastation. The Church of England's reasons for decline, well, are pretty, pretty obvious. But it's the same decline we're seeing in thriving dynamic churches. We're seeing a decline in income and attendance as people. One of the statistics this report said is that they're not going to get 20% of the people back who were coming before, partially because they now like sitting in their recliner with a cup of coffee in their hand, watching church with their pajamas on. Mm -hmm. Um, how do you get those people back in the pew? How do you get them dressed, cross town, and back in the pews by 9 o'clock? For a certain amount of the population, going to church was habitual. You know, just something they did on a Sunday. And those people who had the habit, uh, who went f for reasons beyond faith and uh, the, the nice scented candles, uh, that habit is over. They've discovered that uh, they can either do this online through church or that they can actually sleep in on Sunday mornings, and that's not so bad either. And you have lost the habitual attenders, and in this day and age, the church needs every person uh, to be up front, and they're not there anymore. Now, we will get people who will make comments that, well, if they were true Christians, and so on and so forth. Um, friends, I don't think the world works that way. I've been in my parish now, starting my seventh year, and it's taken me seven years to have every member of the vestry being a believing, committed Christian. Um, I'm not knocking anybody, mm -hmm. but it's a gradual process where you awaken people into this power of Jesus Christ in their lives and get them out of, as you say, the routine. And when and I have to, I would say most Episcopalians, most Anglicans are cultural Christians. Um, not as many as we would want are alive with the power of the Spirit. And so we're seeing that winning wing away. Now, the flip side is what we'll have left may be more committed, but will they be able to pay the heat bills? Yeah, well, we've talked about what COVID has done to the church many times over the last year. And one of it is the winnowing, you know, the, the taking and uh, just a complete disruption of church life, a complete disruption of the church model. And we're going to see what happens after this uh, all plays out. I wanted us to, to return back to the Church of England and talk a little bit about Justin Welby. Um, and to be fair, when Justin Welby first came to office as the Archbishop of Canterbury, you and I were kind of fanboys. We thought for sure that uh, he had the resume, he was going to be a great peacemaker, but he was involved in the evangelical side of Anglicanism in the Church of England, that this could only be a win after the period of Rowan Williams. And so we, we were very fair to him for the first year, maybe 18 months. And then we just started to see the pattern, the, the pattern of it being more of a corporate job than a job of a clerical archbishopship. And we're kind of really seeing that play out now in some of the behind the scenes reporting and you and I were forwarded an article from, uh, what's it called? What's Private that? Eye. Private Eye. That talked Private a little, Eye. 
talked a little bit about uh, the behind the scenes with Justin Welby, and I thought you may want to talk about that a little. Yeah, it, not only has the press been reporting about a 20% expected decline in income and in people at the Church of England, it's been a bad PR week. George Carey took to the op-ed pages of the Telegraph to basic to exoriate the Church of England's disciplinary process, where there's a star chamber that you can be accused and be placed in the limbo and not know what you've done or have only vague things, and an unnamed, unaccountable, un, a, a clique, a cabal, can basically destroy your life. And he was the former Archbishop of Canterbury, and they did it to him. George Carey was grudgingly exonerated of all problems this past week. We reported on that. On Monday, the Bishop of Lincoln, who is sort of a corporate liberal, not neither fish nor fowl, has been suspended for 20 months. And we don't know why. But this finally past week, uh, he was reinstated after he made a sincere, contrite apology for not having supervised and taken appropriate action against notices of abuse. So he didn't do a good job. He wasn't an abuser. We had the report on the former bishop, uh, Victor uh, uh, Hubert Victor Witsey. I yes, love the yes. name Hubert. <laughs> who was bishop, uh, I think, Chester in yep. the 1980s, who is now dead, who was a child molester. And the church apologized profusely for not acting against the child molester bishop. And now, Private Eye, and it says something when Private Eye is the best source of church news in England, has an article that basically is a knife in the belly of Justin Welby. Um, the story, and I have it in front of me, is uh, the first line, I think, is telling. A recurring theme in the Church of England's handling of abuse allegations is the habit of senior clergy giving the benefit of the doubt to pedophile priests. Now another shocking case has been revealed. In December, a priest named John Roberts was jailed for 10 years for abusing little boys. This is not his first conviction. In the 80s, he was convicted of abusing a 15-year-old boy in the Diocese of Liverpool. The Bishop of Liverpool said, tut, tut, don't do it again, and he was back in his job. When he retired in the 2000s, he got a job as a volunteer priest at Liverpool Cathedral. And while he was at Liverpool Cathedral, he worked with children, and then he worked with down and outs and various troubled men, young men. One of these troubled young men went to his supervisor and complained that he was being molested. The supervisor said, I don't believe you, and he banned him from coming back to the church. This supervisor was Justin Welby. You have oh, a convicted weird. man already convicted once of being a pedophile. He's accused, credibly accused again. He's working with children at your cathedral. And you drive away the, the victim by saying, stay away, you're bothering me, kid. And now well, and he's the article, been jailed for 10 more years. Right, and the article says that uh, all Justin Welby did was make him promise that he won't do it again. And guess what? The, the promise did not hold. And so, you know, it, it, here the victim is at fault. What, we, what we're seeing here with, you know, certainly in the Church of England is anonymous sources uh, can end your career, but proven allegations fought within the courts aren't so bad. You know, and that's, that's not the way to the run a church. Johnson Tamu, the former Archbishop of York, the current Archbishop of York, Stephen Cottrell, or Cottrell, if you're American or English, you pronounce it differently, have public, they screwed up on this same exact topic of not reporting and of taking appropriate action. In this Cottrell's case, it was when he was Bishop of Reading. And the Bishop of Lincoln was suspended for 20 months for doing what? Uh, publicly, what has been released is less serious. Now we have Justin Welby. Justin Welby, who is still to apologize to the victors of John Smythe, who has, as dean of Liverpool Cathedral, uh, did 
things far worse than George Carey was uh, accused of and suspended from the ministry. The rule that, well, the, the private eye says, the moral of the story, if you're abused by a clergyman and you want to report it to the church, be sure to do it politely. If you come across as angry, it will take the word of a convicted pedophile over yours. I don't, how can Justin Welby survive this with integrity? Because how he can hit, the well, he, uh, stand that, he, behind him? He, he hasn't survived with integrity yet. You, you keep, you're, you're putting on this uh, assumption, uh, this adjective of integrity. He doesn't have it, so he's not going to survive with it or without it. But he has survived by surrounding himself with like-minded people who just work in the corporate way. You know, there's, there's the how to get this done way, and then there's the how to avoid those who are complaining way. And they've mastered that very well, George. Um, let's move on in news. See, uh, it, there's a, if I, if I may pontificate, sure. which I've been doing for about oh, 10 years yeah. now on this show, <laughs> what this speaks of is a lack of love as Christ teaches us. The, the way the church has handled this has not been as a loving institution that seeks the good for all people, but as a very secular, very small minded, very unchristian institution and it may, it may be that justin welby is the perfect man to run such an institution but i have serious doubts as to whether or not the holy spirit is present and working through such a body i can't disagree george that uh is something you and i have discussed uh george uh, i'm sorry uh, gavin ashton and i did an episode called the hoax church talking about the church of england i'll put a link to that in the show notes, um, it has been a very troublesome mother church for centuries. And we're going to uh, see this again play out. I think one of the problems is a state church, and one of the problems is it's not run as a Christ Christian institution. And then there's all the other problems. So <laughs> I did want to move on. I don't want to talk about the Church of England for all 23 minutes. Let's move on and talk about Pope Francis. So, but before oh. you know, I, before we get on, there's a lot of people who watch Anglican Unscripted who are not Anglican or Roman Catholic, and they may not know what a magisterium is. And I have on here uh, the show George Conger, who is a, a history buff of church history like no other. Can you explain to the audience what a magisterium is and whether or not Anglicanism has one? We do not have a magisterium. Magisterium is that received collection of beliefs which defines succinctly the church. Mm -hmm. And it's in the Catholic world, surrounds the papacy, the institution of the papacy. Right. Not the Pope, mind you, so much as the institution of the papacy and the official doctrinal teachings of the church. The Anglican world does not have as defined a magisterium. We have a consensus approach. And part of the problems of the last 50 years is that consensus has been destroyed by people deciding to act out of prophetic insight rather than the received wisdom of the church. But Francis has just, Francis is the Catherine Jeffrey Shorey of the Catholic world. He just makes my day because I'm sure, well, he blows the, he blows the tops of conservatives on so many issues, but every now and then he'll come and stick a knife into the liberals. He's done it to them over abortion. Um, for instance, he, Francis is really strongly against abortion. will say good stuff and powerful stuff mm -hmm. uh, from time to time. Now, Francis has issued a, uh, a directive after a meeting of the Catechetical Office of the Italian Episcopate uh, earlier this month on January 30th. Uh, what is that? In other words, the teaching office of the Italian Catholic Church, Pope Francis and in addition to being Pope, is the head of the Italian Catholic Episcopal Conference. And Francis said, I want you to stick to the catechism of the church. Don't go off in your own interpretation. Stick to the catechism of the church. Because if you don't stick to the catechism of the church, you know what's going to happen? Women priests! <laughs> Francis! <laughs> Francis, the worst thing that you can do 
So what's going to happen if you go off and become heretical and do your own little thing and have your own private interpretation? Not go to hell. More people are going to be stuck with women priests. (laughs) You're not going to go to hell. You're going to wind up as Episcopalians if you don't follow the catechism. So here's Francis turning on a dime. In the past, we have called him the best Episcopalian out there. And now he's warning people that if you don't follow the magisterium and the catechesis of the Catholic Church, you're going to turn into Episcopalians with women priests and, oh my. Yeah, you know, I thought, in the back of my mind, I always thought he was he would have been uh, pro-women clergy in some form, uh, if not just, in a minor sense, deacons. Uh, and to see him say this, I'm just like, what side of the bed did he wake up on that he was so pissed that he went off and just caused another firestorm in uh, certainly the Roman Catholic media uh, to watch this play out, because you and I have said before, he's an Anglican want to be, and Anglican want to bees don't follow the magisterium, don't honor it, and uh, it, to be a true Anglican, uh, you, you're kind of iffy on the Thirty Nine Articles. You are not sure which prayer book is your favorite. Uh, you don't know which formulators of the Church are really that much fun, and the councils of the Church, you, you pick three of your favorite eight. You know, that, that makes you a good Anglican. So, I don't know, George. <laughs> See, uh, well, Francis really is a Peronist Christian. Yeah, He's good, taken yeah. the politics of Argentina of mm-hmm. Juan Peron and applied it to church life. Uh-huh. And one of the hallmarks of Peronism is to be all things to all people, to say things to favor the left, then to say things to favor the right. Be nice to the trade unions. Be nice to the generals. Be nice to the poor. Be nice to the landed oligarchs. Uh, so long as you maintain your power. Now, Francis was saying that the last time people objected to the catechism and to the magisterium after Vatican I, we had the formation of the old Catholic Church because they were saying they were being more faithful than the Pope to the teachings of the Church. And then Francis went on to say, and what happened to the old Catholics? They now have women clergy. So now if you're not faithful to Vatican II, you could go off and be even kookier than the old Catholics with their women clergy. So Francis has managed to insult uh, the old Catholics, insult the liberals, and insult the conservatives by saying, if you don't follow Vatican II, which any conservative Catholics do not like, they don't just like as it. bad as the old Catholics. Yep. So it's just wonderful. <laughs> Francis, I wish him long life and a happy career because he just keeps me in the keeps me with copy. If if my prayers are ever answered, there'll be a Vatican three and Pope Francis will be the Pope at the time of Vatican Three. That that would be um, <laughs> Yes. Kevin, I can I can I talk about Campala three? Sure, why not? Kampala three, the meeting of the the Ugandan House of Bishops and Yeah, Kampala. let's let, let's transfer to Uganda here. Oh, I'm sorry. I no, no, thinking, let's do it. I, I'm, a little too vague. Yep. Yeah, tell us about the, the Uganda story here. Well, we've been covering the story on Stanley and Tagali for a number of weeks now. Stanley and Tagali, the former Archbishop, uh, was disciplined by the current Archbishop Stephen Kazimba uh, for ha- committing adultery. And this caused a firestorm, and the House of Bishops of Uganda had a meeting this past week because many bishops were angry with the archbishop, current archbishop, for how they thought he handled this. And they're specifically angry because Anglican Inc. broke the story. They had to learn about it from Anglican Inc., not from the rest of the, from the official organs of the Church of Uganda. So you and I were topics of conversation indirectly in the Ugandan House of Bishops meeting. And what and this was a secret meeting, so this is second, third, fourth, fifth hand, so take it for what it's worth. Second hand. The uh, story is that uh, everybody's agreed that Stanley Intigali blotted his copybook. Mm-hmm. And Stephen Kazimba said, now look, this is not just He's being accused of favoring GAFCON and foreigners over the Church of Uganda. Why tell these two white guys uh, in the United States before your own people and embarrass us in front of the world? And Stephen Kazimba responded that this was not 
done by him alone. He gathered senior bishops and the senior leaders, lay leaders of the Church of Uganda. They investigated this. Stanley Ntigali confessed his sin. There's no question as to his guilt. And a statement was released on the 13th of January. Coincidentally, the president of Uganda, his government, shut down the internet because of the national elections. And so the people in Uganda in the countryside basically were cut off from news access and communications were basically landlines, which in Uganda are either non-existent or very spotty. And you and I heard about this via telephone and we asked around and questions were asked and we were asked basically to sit on this until a public statement could be released. And we sat on it until the 18th of January, five days, and the Ugandans sent us a statement once the internet was turned back on. So it wasn't a case of favoring American journalists or favoring GAFCON. Rather, it was they had no way to communicate with anybody really inside the country because Uganda is on a partial lockdown due to yeah. COVID as well. So it just was the... Uh, bl- uh, strange coordination of things, of uh, the shutdown, the internet going off, and the Ugandan bishops basically accepted what was told to them. And uh, so now the only international leader who despises us is uh, Archbishop Justin Welby. Uh, Oh, I'm so, uh, for those who are new to the show, at the Lambeth uh, primates not meeting but primates <laughs> gathering gathering <laughs> in canterbury a few years ago we had some primates telephoning us there was no press allowed but we had primates telephoning us from the men's room and you could tell because you had that reverberation and echo <laughs> and we were reporting from the meeting as the meeting was taking place and some rather strong words of opprobrium were drummed on kevin and george uh that was the, the primate. <laughs> yeah. But it, and my number two rule of journalism is don't become the news. Yeah, back then we, we, we became the news that one time. That was, that was pretty sad. Um, I do want to move and on. We became the news this time, but it was a mis- it, it, We became inadvertently the news. Don't uh, don't story. kill the messenger, guys. That you know that's my 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 hot topic and advice to you guys. Uh, you watch us because you get the breaking news. Don't complain when we have the breaking news. Uh, last story, maybe not. We'll see how long we're going here. I gotta look at the time. You know, with these Indian uh, corruption, Indian uh, corruption, progressive lenses, corruption. it's hard to look at the time. Thirty-three minutes. Oh, we need to clean this up here, George. So, um, let's talk a little bit about what we talked about last week, which is the statement from the House of Bishops in the ACNA about sexuality and sexual identity. We complimented the statement they put out. It was a great statement. Uh, It is still incomprehensible to me how so many bishops could agree on such a good statement. We've not seen this in such a long time. And we put that out there. It didn't take too long for one or two people, um, and especially a bishop, to come up with a response to that statement. Uh, Bishop Todd Hunter, uh, what diocese is he from, George? C for S of Christ for, for the sake third, of others. Uh, yep. And so, um, I'm. Sounds f- like an explosive compound to me. I, I don't know. Well, well, which is cool. You know, it's innovative in the name. Um, Todd Hunter and I go back. I I won't call him a friend, but certainly an acquaintance, and I do appreciate his work as uh, a bishop. Um, he uh, put out a statement that said um, to be more pastoral. Um, blah, 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 blah. And this taken out to the internet. I thought we could talk about it um, because it indicated that um, maybe your identity is not in Christ alone in, in a statement. And I thought uh, as a theologian you are and as a, a lay Christian that I am, we could have a good discussion about whether or not you can hyphenate your Christianity. So, George, what does this statement say? Well, I'll preface this by saying I do not make a claim to be a theologian. 
What? My, tra know? my training was a ch as a church historian, a That's history right. okay. historian I'll, I'll of theology, okay. All right. not a theologian proper. Well, um, you're a more theologian than I am. <laughs> Todd Hunter released a letter to the members of his diocese that basically walked back the pastoral statement put out by the bishops. And he started off using that same word, love of Francis. Mm -hmm. The ACNA College of Bishops I'll quote the letter, it does not speak with the authority of magisterium. So Todd Hunter is saying of the stuff, we're not Catholics, you don't have to believe this. Then he goes on to quote the language saying that the bishop uh, requests that dioceses and publications and teaching events employ the recommended language and the biblical arguments that support this recommendation. So it is not a mandate. So first thing he does is at telling his diocese, pay no attention to the communique man behind the curtain when the communique appears on the screen. It's merely a guidance, and you can be guided by it or not. And then he goes down the path that Kevin talks about of our duty to gay Christians. And my take is that there is no such thing as a, Christ, a gay Christian. There is no such thing as an American Christian. It, you know, our identity in Christ wipes away all everything else. Washes away. I may be yeah. an American. Mm -hmm. I may be an American. I may be this. I may be that. But my first identity is in Jesus Christ. And Todd Hunter appears to be accepting the arguments that there are carve out their forms of carve out Christianity. We have a Christianity for gay people. We have a Christianity, uh, I've seen this used for the disabled. Mm -hmm. This diocese also is pushing, has it amongst its leaders, people pushing critical race theory, that there is a black Christianity as opposed to, I don't know, a white Christianity or an Asian Christianity. Rather than in Christ, there is no slave, no free, Greek, no Jew, male, no female. The Christianity of C4SO is a particularity of Christianities. It caters to, it's a marketing brand of Christianity. Of Let's get our marketing, uh, our identified target audience demographic lined up and we'll sell them that portion of the true faith that appeals to them. Um, to throw some names around, this is exactly what cheap grace is of, uh, of saying that, you know, the gospel, it, you don't pick up your cross and carry me in this situation. What you do is uh, pick up a cross that feels good for you. The danger is this is, this is, the, this is what leads to the Joel Osteens of the world. Uh, this is the path down which heresy arises, of, but not, excuse me, heterodoxy. Heterodoxy, of yeah. Teaching I mean, things that are not, not, not consistent with the true saving doctrines of Jesus Christ. It's certainly not Anglican. Well, I can see the good intention of this. We want a way to communicate uh, in the language of this, this community so that we don't offend them, and that we can kind of speak the same language. I, I get that intention. But in the same way, the gospel isn't changeable. The message of the gospel uh, does not change. That when you are a Christian, you are solely a Christian. Now, I'm uh, um, an Anglican, but I don't call myself an Anglican Christian. I am in Christ alone. And all those hyphenations have been washed away by becoming a Christian. I'm not a heterosexual Christian. I'm not a, you know, I, I don't expect people to uh, identify themselves as a gay Christian. I am in Christ alone, and in that, I don't take on my identity. In Christ alone, I take only on his identity. I am an imitator of Christ. And there's no hyphenation anywhere in the ministry of Jesus. I don't see it. And so I walk back, and I understand good intentions. I understand I, you want to speak their language, but good intentions is a fallacy. And the, the road to hell is paved with a lot of good intentions. What you want to be is honest, 
transparent, and for crying out loud, speak the good news that when they become a Christian, all that is washed away. It worked with me. I'm certain it worked with George. Just, you know, keeping it simple. Kevin, you're so right. And my fear, and again, I apologize if I'm reading too much into this statement. But when we have what are called pastoral considerations as taking paramount place over the true faith, we have the Episcopal Church. Technically, the Episcopal Church's prayer book, uh, as of this morning, the one I've got on my desk next to me, teaches the unadulterated, untrammeled faith of Jesus Christ. Now they're trying to change that to add in gay marriage and whatnot as a pastoral consideration. So we have all these pastoral carve-outs that are made to an unchanging faith that leads to the abandonment of that faith. And if, if we're in the position that I've seen so many times in the Episcopal world, which is we have, a, you mentioned this in our discussion at Lambeth 98, the, American, the majority of American Episcopal bishops supported the prohibition against same-sex blessings, clergy, unions, whatnot, because that was theologically the right thing to do. Then they went home and they said, well, the pastoral thing to do is to ignore the right thing to do. And I believe that true pastoral care is teaching the pure word of Jesus Christ, not adulterating that word to make people temporarily happy. Um, one of the saddest things I've seen is when a clergyman changes his views on a major issue because let's say you have a child. Uh, I've known clergy who have been very fierce on the gay issue. Then their child comes out as homosexual or lesbian and they flip-flop. I've heard known clergy who are very fierce on divorce and remarriage and their child gets divorced and remarried. Now, it's one thing to have an evolving view based on the study of scripture and revelation. It's another thing to say, well, I love my child more than I love the faith of Jesus Christ. And that's the danger with the approach that I see being taken here and that the hard truths, the necessary truths, the uncomfortable truths Christ came not for our comfort, but for our salvation. And if we, if we forget that, then we're just a little better than Joel Osteen. Then you and I need to go on a diet. You need some hair. I need to whiten my teeth. And then we'll, you know, tell, you know, oh, you everything geez. that yeah. you want to hear about yourself. No, it's my teeth. <laughs> yeah. that, uh, I hear it. Oh, my gosh. No, you're right. I mean, and I hate to say this, but... When you hyphenate Christianity, you've created a heresy. You know, plain and simple, Christianity was not meant to include your identity. It was only meant to include the identity of Christ, for with which we are imitators. This is basic Christianity 101, I know, and I understand the intention. But the intention here and in so many other times we've watched in Christian history goes awry because we've lost the identity of Christ by trying to hyphenate him to us. It just doesn't work. It does never the, work. The, Christ, the, the Christian, Christianity is at a fairly low ebb in Germany, for instance. Mm. And it's not really due solely to secularism. Most of the collapse of Christianity in my reading of history arose because the churches in the 1930s enthusiastically became German Christians. They changed the Christian faith, especially the Protestants, and also many Catholics too, and adopted an aped Nazi ideology and propaganda and incorporated that into their church and worldview. Yeah. I, we saw that in Russia in the 1920s, where there was a branch of the Orthodox Church that fought to sought a way to combine communism with orthodoxy. And we've seen this in the, if you will, the Jack Spong Episcopalianism of the church, what's happening now, combining woke elements of the culture, of the 
of the nihilism and the antinomianism of the moment into a faith for today. And it never lasts. And it usually leaves people disillusioned and sour and, well. I think we've talked this to death. <laughs> Uh, oh well, you know, and you know, this is reality that sometimes we got to talk about hard topics. This is one of those hard topics because Kevin can see the good intention in this, but Kevin, through history, and George is a history uh, church historian, knows that this is going to not end well. I think that's all our stories for today. Yes, there's Indian corruption, but we've already done our audience forty some minutes of pure pain. Um, only eight. Technically, only 80% of our audience is listening right now, George. That's, that's that's hard. We're talking to more less and less people every moment. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 644 of Anglican Unscripted. The cool thing is there's nothing I have to forget to edit out this time, George. 